of the many, 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 many characters in the Bible. I think Balaam is one of my favorites to learn from, and that is probably not necessarily good because he's not really a nice guy. I mean, if we look at the stories and, well, but wait a minute. Wasn't he a good guy? I mean, he, yeah, we, he had a rough start. You know, he, he, he certainly was not opposed to cursing Israel. And yeah, he's super mean to his donkey. So if you're a donkey, he's not your friend, but still, I mean, he was ultimately a good dude, right? He spoke to the angel of the Lord, which is in essence like talking to God himself. And we know that God opened his eyes, it says back in chapter 24 in the book of Numbers. And I mean, we, we say Balaam's words every single day. When we come into the synagogue, we sing, Ma tovu Yaakov. Right? We say that prayer and, how lovely are your tents, O oh Jacob? This seems like a pretty good dude. Now, all of a sudden this week, we're reading in our, our last portion of the book of Numbers, Israel cuts him down. And along with these other kings, he, he kills him. And so after he said these great words, my question is, where is the justice in that? And Judaism sort of presents a bit of a mixed picture of Balaam because we have this varied set of opinions, and it's not hard to find traditional texts that speak of Balaam as a pretty good dude. I mean, he's listed as one of seven Gentile prophets. Midrash even compares him on some level to Moses and talks about how God had given him this amazing gift of prophecy and how he was blessed. But on the other hand, and I think this is probably the more prevalent opinion, he was not viewed very kindly by Judaism. In other words, he, he wasn't a good dude. And we don't really have to look too far. We can look at some of the classic commentators. Uh, Ramban is a great example. The Talmud and other rabbinic literature does not speak kindly, refers to him as Rasha, as an evil one. And I think most pointedly, we look to the text of the Bible itself, and we read in Joshua 13, 22, it says, Balaam also, the son of Beor, the one who practiced divination, was killed with the sword by the people of Israel among the rest of their slain. The one who practiced divination. Balaam, or Balaam in English, was a sorcerer. He was a diviner. He was a false prophet. And even more than that, pushing beyond, he was a deceiver. He was an illusionist of the worst kind. He was in it for himself. He was a wordsmith. And you know that term, a skilled user of words, sometimes used positively, but certainly can be used in a negative sense. And I think in that wordsmithing of Balaam, we find a picture of ourselves for better or worse, better or worse that I want to share with you today. We're moving into the into the last book of the Torah. We're moving from Bamidbar. We'll conclude that book today, or did actually, in the Torah reading this morning. And the next stop is Devarim, right? Which means words. Devar, singular. Devarim, plural. And this that I'm giving you now is a Devar Torah. It's a Torah word. But as you've heard me say so many times before, Judaism doesn't see the word word as being sufficient. It's not a sufficient enough word to describe the word word. Are you with me? Words like, like, like things. They're, they're tangible things. A devar can be a word, but it's also a thing. They're deeply connected in that sense. Words are tangible, like a fist or a gun or a hug or a kiss. They possess power. Words accomplish things. After all, Hashem created the world with what? Words. He said, let there be, and there was. 
And this is a, if, if this were the direction I was going, it's a classic sermon. Who hasn't heard at least 10 messages in life about taming the tongue and not using words as weapons and, and the, the myth that sticks and stones may break bones, but words don't hurt me. Words do hurt, right? They definitely can hurt. For as long as I can remember, I have understood the very tangible power of these things called words. You see, my mom is one of the most influential people in my life. I love her from my core. She has walked through trials and every other thing with me has always supported me. We have one of the most, or uh, we couldn't have a better relationship as mother and son. And yet, as I was growing up, I had a special ability to use words to hurt my mom. And we kind of played off each other in that. We, we, we just, you know, we, when we were angry with one another, we, we both, I guess, possessed this, this ability to use words that way. And, you know, we, we would, when we would have a, fight and usually those fights were my fault because I was a pretty rambunctious teenager but we kind of would reach into our mutual word holsters and draw our weapons not handguns but but harsh words and they were designed you know to to hurt each other that's what we did and and that was just it's kind of the way it was thank god you know through maturity and through the work of the lord that that changed. I got better at that for sure and stopped doing that, thank God. And after all, I mean, it was my mom. She loved me. Even when I even when I said things to hurt her, she forgave me. She was my mom, right? So we we got over those things and we would always say, I love you. I didn't mean it. I was angry. And we would go on. But a problem developed in me. Because that resurfaced when I met the woman that I would marry. You want to know something? We never fought. Not even one time when we were dating. And then we tied the knot. And big surprise, things got different. But my way of fighting that I had used against my mom was, you know, it had always worked before. When I would pull out the word weapon and cock it, and that means to take the time to think of something that would really hurt, and then, bam, fire the weapon. And you know what? With my wife, my new wife, it worked. It worked especially well because she wasn't used to that, and it broke her down. It devastated her because she had a hard time reconciling that I could, I could, I, I could give the appearance of one thing and yet say something else somewhere in my heart, have the ability to say and be something so incredibly different, to speak one thing and be another, something so mean. And it hurt her. But there was something far worse. Something even more damaging. Because even in those instances early on when I would do that, she could forgive me because, and she did forgive me because she knew that I loved her and that, that I had, I had done that in the past, that I had fought like that and that I really didn't mean it. And I could say, listen, I'm working on it. I won't do it again. I won't hurt you like that. But the next time, when another fight happened and the same thing happened, when those same hurtful words proceeded from my mouth, when it didn't change and she would get hurt again. And I would try to say, ah, I, I'm sorry. I love you. I didn't mean it. I was just angry. My words made me into something else, something like Balaam, a deceiver an illusionist, a negative wordsmith, someone in it for myself who would say what needed to be said 
to get out of the situation. A sorcerer with words of apparent kind intention, but behind the words, an angry person lived there, a person who wanted to hurt. And the only conclusion that Kelly, my wife, could draw was this. I heard what you said when you said you loved me and didn't want to hurt my feelings. But I see what you do again and again. And talk is cheap. And if she knew this quote from Benjamin Franklin, well done is better than well said. She would have told me that. This is Balaam's story. This is why the seemingly good dude full of blessing for Israel in this week's Parsha is struck down, killed by the sword. Because sometimes there's something way worse than angry words. And those are empty words. Empty words, which can actually hurt worse. I heard what you said, but I see what you do. And there are plenty of examples, biblical examples. In Matthew 26, but Peter said to him, even though all may fall away because of you, I'll never fall away. Yeshua said to him, truly, I say to you that this very night before a rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. All the disciples said the same thing too. Isn't it interesting that that's always referred to as Peter's denial? Did you ever notice that last bit? All the disciples said the same thing too. I'll never leave you. I hear what you said, but I see what you do. Matthew 21, the parable of the two sons. A man had two sons. He came to the first and said, son, go to work today in the vineyard. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. The man came to the second and said the same thing, and he answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. I heard what you said, but I see what you do. And of course, the star of our show today, Balaam, why was he killed? Well, he was full of sweet blessings and kindness for Israel, wasn't he, when he said all those beautiful things, Matovu, and I, I see a star, I see a star rising, and but not yet, all that was great prophecy, but he didn't mean it. They were words to him and nothing more. Kuf Samech Mem, that's how you spell Kasam, Joshua calls him, a sorcerer, an illusionist, a diviner, a false prophet whose words mean nothing, and his actions indicate his reality. Whatever works for Balaam, Balaam says. Balaam induced the Israelites to trespass against the Lord. He could care less about Israel. As a matter of fact, if he has his way, Israel will destroy itself. And thus his beautiful prophecies lose some of their, their shining luster, don't they, when we see the intentions and the true feelings behind the man who brought them. He spoke empty words. Yes, they, I understand these are the words of Hashem that he, he gave to Balaam, but he, one of the criticisms in Judaism is he was a, he had no choice but to say those things because God made him say them, but they meant nothing to him. And I hope you see my point. Because Beyond the angry words that I use to hurt the people I love, when I say I will change and do not, angry words become, became empty words. And I know it's a big statement to say that empty words can hurt worse than angry words. But when I'm sorry, I won't do it again, or I'll work on it, whatever the, whatever the thing is, when actions don't follow, when words become meaningless and empty to whoever we're saying them to, what we're really saying is, you don't matter. You're not really worth the effort to change. I'll say what I have to to get out of this or get what I want, but in the end, you don't matter. And those empty words, man, they hurt. 
There's a song I used to listen to a guy a lot named Ben Harper. He has a song called Roses from My Friends. It says, stones from my enemies, these wounds will mend, but I cannot survive. Roses from a friend. Stones for my enemy, these wounds will mend, but I cannot survive roses for my friend. It's not the Bible, but it speaks in this way. Because a pretty packaged up promise of words that we give to someone like a beautiful rose and these are all the things I'm going to do without genuine action. When the petals fall off the rose, what you're left with is a stick full of thorns. And I don't think Ben, I don't know if Ben Harper believes in the Bible or not, but it's easy to handle hateful words from enemies because you know they hate you. But when someone gives you a beautiful packaged up nothing, man, that hurts. And you know the last part of this? We even do that to ourselves. When you empty word yourself, when you say, I'm gonna, and you don't, or I'm not gonna, and you do, when you do that enough, you disappoint even yourself. You lose faith even in you. Well done is better than well said. And speaking of empty words, rabbis and pastors, we love to use words, don't we? The danger of being a rabbi is that you can put so much emphasis on words and talk a lot and say a lot. But if what I say has no impact in this room, or to anyone listening online, if these words don't inspire action, they're useless. Charles Spurgeon said this, it's well to preach as I do with my lips, but you can all preach with your feet and by your lives. And that is the most effective preaching. So I hope that these words take up residence in your soul, in your, in your spirit, in your life, in your application. And you need a, speaking of applications, a cultural application to top it off, here you go. We are surrounded, surrounded in society by a bunch of angry but empty words. So, so, so many words by so, so, so many people with so, so, so much to say and so little to do. Everyone with a solution for this and that and an answer to every problem, but for someone else to do. And man, I hope that, I hope that the times will change, but the past has been filled and the present. I'm afraid, in our current society with so many empty words. Balaam was a sorcerer, a magic man with words, and he was a failure. He got busted, he got revealed, and he died because of it. But as I said, I hate to say it, but I've learned great lessons from him. He's not necessarily the guy you want to be learning your lessons from, but I hope today you'll see a bit of improvement from him for you too. It's pretty straightforward, and as, Yeshua, as usual, Yeshua said it best. He was talking about vows, but it applies to this lesson today. Let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is of evil, and I would say, let your words always be recognized for the powerful things, the tangible things that they are, especially to the ones you love, but certainly to everyone. Let your yes be yes and your no be no and deliver. Let's tame our tongues, not only to guard against saying things that can hurt or cause harm, but against speaking the empty words without intention. Let's devote ourselves to being men and women who honor our words with action and integrity. Well done is better than well said. And I think, I know, our Messiah would agree. 
Shabbat Shalom. We're building the kingdom and thankful that you're a part of that mission. If this teaching inspired you, please consider a financial gift to support the work of Shalom Macon. Visit MaconMessianic.com and click Give Online. May the Lord bless and keep you.